Hi all, you are more and more every day watching my videos. Thanks to you and to those who commented here on Reddit or Facebook, my channel is starting to grow and I am extremely grateful. I am trying to improve the audio, video and content with each video I release and I hope you will like this one too. SN15 is next to fly. Elon Musk said there were some big changes and a hundred little ones that made the SN15 a major upgrade of the last series, namely SN8 to SN11. We are now going to review the most important ones and then speculate a little bit about the launch date. No official date has been released yet, but some hints can help us refine our guess. But enough talking, let's get on with it already. We will review the improvements of SN15 from the bottom up, and no, the landing legs haven't been upgraded. In fact, Elon Musk is tweeting about getting rid of them even though they will be needed to land on Mars on the moon, and quite frankly, his idea of catching the falling starship mid-air seems completely insane. Let's start with the Raptor engines. The overall plumbing is way less messy and takes less space. Also, the methane preburner is now placed away from the central axis of the ship. These two design changes, along with the changes in the thrust pack itself, give more leeway around the motor. In turn, this allows the thrust vector control, or TVC, rods to be attached to the thrust pack itself, instead of the thrust dome. The TVC, as its name implies, is a device that turns the motor during the flight, to control the vehicle's orientation. The new design will remove stress from the thrust dome which is a good thing, given the RUD of SN11 was related to the motor rupturing the dome and the tanks. The construction process used to create the nozzles from a piece of metal has also changed, and this will allow SpaceX to take less time to create them. Ramping up Raptor production is crucial to have enough motors for the super heavy boosters. More than 30 motors will be needed for each booster in the end, and only 60 Raptors have been produced so far. This new process gives the engine bell a nice dark green color. Four new Raptors are currently available at Starbase or Boca Chica, numbered 56 to 59. Three of them will be mounted on SN15. What do you think will be the winning numbers? Place your bet in the comments below. We've already talked about it, the thrust bug design has been changed. By the way, the thrust puck is this inverted cone that is designed to receive all the thrust from the three or later six engines and distribute it evenly on the rest of the structure. Given the massive thrust of the Raptor, this is one hell of a job, and the redesign was certainly not easy. Apart from the new TVC attachments we've already discussed, the main plumbing used to deliver the methane to the three engines through the thrust puck has been completely redesigned. Remember what I told you about the Raptor's methane pre-burners being now turned outwards instead of inwards to get more leeway for TVC? Well, to feed those pre-burners, the pipes had to turn too. That's why the methane pipe now pierces the thrust puck in its center instead of in three separate points. Apart from the benefits for the Raptor's TVC, this direct plumbing will allow the methane to flow more easily and maybe help avoid the rough start that destroyed SN11. Of course, this new design has to be tested. That is why the Raptors were not installed before the rollout as they were for the previous Starships. One of the milestones of the week will thus be to install the hydraulic ram onto the thrust puck and simulate the engine's thrust to validate the design. One visible change from one Starship prototype to the other is a number of thermal protection tiles, or TPS. Thermal protection is needed to survive the intense heat of atmospheric reentry from orbit, but in the early design this protection was provided by transpiration of the cryogenic propellants. Since at least mid-2019, though, this complicated system has been replaced by more conventional, cheap and reusable heat tiles, in conjunction with a thermal blanket. A handful of different tile models will be used to cover the whole hot side of the ship and the engineers have tested many different ways to attach them to the steel structure. A lot of the modifications listed here are only marginally improving the performance but will drastically facilitate the switch to mass production of starships. From 11 tiles on SN8, we are now at more than 800 tiles on SN15 and they are not even needed for this suborbital test. 
The only reason there are so many of them is to practice their installation and the teams have to prove to Elon Musk that they can indeed ramp up the production. On a smaller scale, we can also spot much better cable and pipe management. Everything is quite neatly attached to the outside of the ship and probably to the inside as well. This might seem very low level, but it is the same point as the thermal ties. Not needed for the test, but crucial for the later industrialization phase where everything has to find its place. I bet you also noticed the overall welding quality was improving from prototype to prototype. SN15 is now almost mirror quality, at least if you compare it to previous starships. The only thing that seems to still have room for improvement is a weld to attach the nose cone to the rest of the rocket. I bet SN20 would be perfect. One of the things we definitely cannot see is the avionics system. Luckily, Elon Musk tweeted about it and they have been remodeled as well. What could have been done? Well, each prototype followed a slightly different path during its descent, precisely to test the avionics and modes of the flight. Surely, the ship's reactions have been processed and the flight software updated to better control the ailerons. But I am certain there are also changes on the hardware side. For instance, many of the flights and some of the static fires ended up in a minor fire that sometimes damaged the avionics. With SN10, it caused half of the landing legs to fail. With SN11, it eventually caused the whole ship to rapidly disassemble. Therefore, all the important avionics sensors are now placed on better protected spots and the overall reliability will be improved. The last thing I know about SN15 is the Starlink antenna, or DC Mac flat face, as SpaceX calls it, that has been installed directly onto the exterior of the ship. I bet SpaceX did not need it for the telemetry, but it will hopefully improve the camera link during flights. That is a direct gift from Elon to us. Please flood him with love messages on Twitter for that initiative. And that wraps up the improvements I can think of. If you think that was useful, please hit the like button. That would mean the world to me, and thank you very much. The most important question of the coming week, when will SN15 fly? I already treated that in my last video, so here is my little calculations. I've plotted the time between rollout and takeoff for every prototype since SN8. If you trace an exponential trend between the dots, that will indicate a launch early next week. But since SN15 has to undergo some testing the latest prototypes were exempted from, I think it is safe to bet for the end of the week, namely April the 22nd or 23rd. What do you think will happen? I've shown you mine, it's time to show me yours. Tell me in the comments when you think the launch will be. If your date is the closest to the actual flight, your comment will appear in my next video. And that wraps up this video. Next big design change will be SN20 featuring a full heat shield and separation device for the orbital test in July. But before that, BN2 is supposed to fly by the end of April and a lot of things can happen in between. On your right is a video of the YouTube algorithm things you might enjoy. And on your left is my playlist with my other Starship dedicated video. Be sure to subscribe if you want to be notified when the next video comes out. This was Getting to Space, signing off.